It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing messages of hope around the world. Friends, welcome to It Is Written. You know, It Is Written is a program all about the Bible and how God is leading people all around the world, how he's led people in the past, leading people today, and will lead people in the future. Today, I have with me a special guest who has a story that is truly amazing. I want to welcome to the show Pastor Manuel Donoso. Pastor Donoso, so glad to have you here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Very good. Now, Pastor, you are the pastor of the Nepean Church in Ottawa. You've been there for 14 years. You've pastored for 25 years. Yes. Now, Pastor Donoso has written a book called The Risk Taker's Journey, A Risk Taker's Journey. It is an autobiography where he shares his life story. In the next few shows, we're going to get a little snippet of that story, but make sure you stay tuned in because at the end of the show, I will tell you how you can get a copy of this book. So Pastor Donoso, you are a pastor of a Seventh-day Adventist church, of a Christian church. Have you been a Christian all your life? Yes, I believe I was uh, right from the very early age. Very good. Now, talk to me a little bit about, Pastor, where did you grow up? Where are you from? Give me a little bit of your history as a, as a youth. I was born in, in Chile, in the countryside, in the central valley of Chile. Uh, my father was a, an administrator of a large farm in, in Chile. So that's where I was born. Okay. And, uh, and basically, uh, my early childhood was... In the, in the farm. Okay. Now, Pastor Genosa, do you have any brothers and sisters growing up? I have, we were three. I have a sister that is the older one, and my brother that was three years older than I died at the age of 26. So it's only uh, the two of us right now, my oh. sister and I. All right. Now, your book, A Risk Taker's Journey, is, is really a fascinating journey on your life story. And so we're going to just talk a little bit uh, about that. But Pastor Donoso, and I'm asking you a broad question because there are a number of pivotal moments in your story, but let's go right to your youth, right to your childhood. Talk to me about those first steps of your journey. And one of the things I think that's very important is that God was leading you on a journey. You may not have known it at the time, and that's how it is for many of us. I know it was for my own story. We didn't sense that God was the one leading us. But now being able to look back on our history, we know that it was God leading us. But talk to me about some of those pivotal moments. Just tell me, talk to me about the kind of the first pivotal moment in your life story, this journey that you took. I think that one of the, uh, the first uh, dramatic experience in my life was when uh, I, at the age of five, um, I didn't understand exactly at the moment, but uh, my father, as I said earlier, was the administrator of a large farm, and he had an affair with a lady in the farm, and the owners of the farm uh, became aware of it, my mother as well, and my father was demoted for a short period of time. That was the idea. They communicated this to my mother, that they will be um, demoting him for a short time and then will be reinstated to his uh, former position. But uh, he couldn't take that, and uh, he actually resigned. And the experience that I wanted to share was the fact that suddenly we had a beautiful home, and suddenly we are moving. Okay. We are moving into another area, uh, and uh, it was very traumatic for the whole family because uh, we were uprooted, and the place where I was going to now, <clears throat> they have no school. And the irony of it all was that we move into the school, the former school, that was the teacher's home plus the classrooms. And, uh, but I have to go away to school because there was no school any longer in that particular area. 
So you're five <clears> years <throat> old. You're uprooted from your uh, from your situation. You go to this new farm. Now, did your father begin as an administrator again at this farm? As a uh, as a foreman, eventually he he rose to uh, again once again to a high position. But I took years. And uh, the most difficult aspect of was going away from home is that I have to travel to take the bus uh, in the weekends that was 12 kilometers away from our home. Wow. And <clears throat> dirt roads, countryside. And it was, um, to me, uh, as a six-year-old, I was kind of afraid making that trip uh, every week. Uh, uh, you know, on Friday coming back and on uh, Sunday going back to the city uh, where I, my family was paying for uh, room and board uh, with a wonderful fam family that uh, look after me. So now I want to make <coughs> sure that, uh, that people don't miss this. So at the age of six, you're actually sent from your home to a boarding school. During the week, you're attending school in the home of these folks? Yeah, I was living with, with someone, and with a family, and yes. I, from there I will go to school. Okay, I can understand that <clears> as, <throat> a, as a six-year-old, I'm sure that that was uh, kind of a frightening ordeal. Uh, now, it, when this was happening, talk to me about how was that beginning to form and bring uh, some formulation to who you would eventually become? I think one of the things that, um, that influenced uh, the way it affected me, I became a very independent type of person and perhaps a risk taker because I was forced to take to make those decisions um, such an early age. So even though uh, the family that I was staying with was very, very nice, they look after me, uh, I really miss home. Uh, and my mother uh, was dear to me and and not being able, especially when I got sick with the flu or something like that, mm. it was very, very hard on me. I'm sure it was. I'm yeah. sure it was. Now, so you were <clears throat> six years old. How long did you uh, have this journey where you were uh, in this boarding situation going to school? Well, one of the things that I want to highlight is the fact that it, since I am a, uh, talking about uh, as well about religion, that when I was walking to the, to the bus every week and from the, from the bus home, I used to talk to God. Okay. Uh, and I think it was kind of out of fear that I was, uh, I guess, uh, uh, I was sensing that there was a being that was aware what I was. And uh, in my own... Uh, a little mind at the time I was able to communicate with this God. And so I learned from a very early age that this God is an amazing being. And even though I was not uh, totally connected with him uh, I, to be aware of, of his presence. Yes. And so the years went by, but I was extremely rebellious. Okay. Uh, extremely rebellious. I went to the same school, a private school, and... Uh, uh, that they have from kinder all the way to uh, high school. So that's the school that I went to. And, uh, but I was extremely rebellious and uh, uh, I had a very hot temper. And uh, my, I used to take uh, temper tantrums uh, often while at home. And one day my, uh, one of my aunt came from Santiago, uh, the capital, to visit us in the summertime. And w I took some of those temper tantrums and my aunt said that the solution for this was for my mother to pull my pants down, sit me in a big drum of cold water. Okay. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I remember that uh, my mother paid heed to the council, but it made me even more rebellious oh. <clears throat> than before. So you find yourself as a youth, you, you're becoming more independent because you're in this boarding situation, but you're beginning a life of kind of congruently uh, a life of prayer, so to speak. You're talking to God, uh, maybe not understanding who he was, but at least having a conversation with him. But at the same time, you're going through this journey where you're rebelling. 
And uh, now let's let's talk a little bit about that. When you are having this time of rebellion, are you rebelling against God? Are you rebelling against your parents? Are you rebelling against everything? What, what's happening there? It was mainly rebelling against my father that um, because of the, I began to understand the consequences of his actions that had affected the whole family. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those things as well in, at that time when I was about uh, six or seven, uh, my father used to drink a little bit too much, and, and one day he, while um, having a meeting with the workers in the farm, uh, they started drinking, they got into an argument, and they, he was a stab in, in the stomach. And I remember uh, coming home uh, bleeding, and we all thought he was going to die. Wow. Uh, and it took a couple of hours before the uh, ambulance would come in. But my rebellion was... I did not have a good relationship with him at all. And, and it's, he seemed to favor my brother, my older brother, as well. So um, this, this rebellion led to, the, to the, uh, him asking the army to take me in. Uh, because um, just uh, a few days before I was to report for service, uh, because in Chile, in Chile you're supposed to, to do service for at least one year, but it was very easy to get out, and I had all planned to get out. So it was a real surprise to me when I arrived at the day we were supposed to report and say, no, you are going in. So you're going through this uh, process, and I, and I want to dwell here just for a moment, uh, uh, Pastor, um, because I know we have a number of viewers. You know, we live in a society where so many homes are broken and so many uh, challenges uh, that people are facing in their own homes. You have this relationship with your father that is a very challenging, a very difficult relationship because as you grow older, you become aware of what your dad did and those actions, and you begin to rebel against him because of who he had become. Um, and, and, and that rebellion doesn't actually mend the relationship. It actually further divided the relationship so much so that your father actually enrolled you uh, in the military. But uh, Pastor Denoso, just dwelling there for a moment, as you were learning these things about your father and rebelling against your father, talk to me a little bit about how you felt. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, because a lot of times when we rebel, we're not, you know, we don't consci conscientiously say, I'm going to rebel. Yeah, exactly. Talk to me a little bit about the feelings, emotions that were going on in you as you were moving into that time and having this rebellion. I think the, the main reason for my rebellion was I was becoming aware of how it had affected my father's um, affairs. That was, that was only one, not only one, rather, but uh, many. Okay. And, and people used to come and tell me uh, that I had a new mother and so on and so forth. So I used to, when I was uh, young, I used to come and tell my mother that. And my mother always, without fail, he used to, she used to say, he is your father, don't listen to gossip, and you must respect your father. Mm. But it didn't settle with me. Uh, and this idea that I needed to respect him uh, because he was my father, when in fact I saw what was happening. So um, during those years, I guess I demonstrated this anger in many ways, uh, uh, you know, by, by fighting with my brother, uh, that was a real uh, difficult time for my mother as well because we, uh, I guess I resented the fact that he was my, my father's favorite. And, and whenever I came to my father, let's say, asked for money, for instance, to go to a, when I was a teenager, uh, he will very often say, no, I don't have any money. But if my brother would come, mm -hmm. So one of the, the things, I guess, the counsel for any viewer that uh, perhaps the children are going through this situation is to not to show favoritism because it's deadly uh, for the person that is not being favored. And, and I appreciate that so much uh, for, for parents to understand the, 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 the importance of, of treating each child, so to speak, equally. Um, and uh, you can treat each child differently as long as there is uh, some equality. So you have this building rebellion. 
you are slotted for your one year of service in the Army as every youth is slotted for, but very easy to get out of. So you had yourself a plan well put together. You show up. And what happens? Well, due to the fact that it was my father have asked uh, the Army to take me in, uh, they were uh, very well into to shape me and into whatever they wanted me to be. And so it, it was an extremely hard time uh, for me uh, in the Army because of the fact that I had been asked uh, to be taken in. And uh, it got to the point where I, I didn't know exactly what to do. Um, the, the discipline was a, a little harsh for me in particular. And, um, and so there was after six months in the Army, uh, one day they announced that uh, if anyone wanted to leave early uh, to come forward and, and, and speak to, to the uh, officer. And I remember kind of jumping into the, and the uh, lieutenant pushed me back and he said, not you, you go right here. And, and uh, so uh, at eight months, uh, some of the uh, uh, companions left and my good friends uh, were included in that. So I was desperate uh, and um, President uh, Eduardo Frey Montalba had just been elected president. So I decided to write to him to do something for me. Okay. Now, I, and again, I want to dwell there for a moment because there, there's, there are young people that watch this show. So you, you show up at the Army. You're expecting fully to get out and go home. And they say, we've got different news. Now, how old were you when this happened? I was... Uh, 18, 17, going on in 18. Okay. So you're 17, 18 years old. You show up. You believe you've got a plan. You're going to go home. You're done with this army business. And to the shock of yourself, you now have to go into the army. And it is almost unbearable for you. It was. You try to get out. You can't get out. You're, in fact, the, the lieutenant, lieutenant tells you, no, no, you're going to stay here. You're going to stay and you're going to rot here. Yeah. The, Talk to me about how you're feeling during all of this. You've got the rebellion situation going on. You're already in a fractured relationship with your father. And now you're in the army because of your father and his call to the army. What's going on in your mind? How are you feeling? And what's this doing for you? I felt totally impotent uh, because there was absolutely nothing that I could do. And in... Uh, and you just need to obey. Um, you know, looking back though, uh, that experience of the army, this discipline, you know, have served me very well over the years, but not at that time, uh, because um, the, the discipline was very, very harsh. So you, you, uh, you, so it's kind of interesting. We're talking about these pivotal moments and I don't want our viewers to miss these pivotal moments. Early on, you're learning about prayer, talking to God. Now, you didn't maybe understand all about it, but you're learning about the idea of talking to God. You're learning independence, how to take care of yourself, which can be both beneficial and detrimental, depending on uh, how that frames in, in the Christian life. And then in the army, even though at the time you didn't enjoy it, you didn't like it, you're learning about discipline. Yes. How long are you in the army? What happens during your army experience uh, beyond just the uh, non-enjoyment of being there? I think one, one of the things that really influenced me in a negative way toward the Army was one day when they, we were practicing salute. And uh, there was this fellow in my company that had really looked forward all his life to become uh, a soldier because uh, his uncle was uh, uh, a lieutenant in the Army. And I remember... The day we went in a large field with uh, over a thousand concrete uh, there doing the same. And this, this uh, young man uh, was uh, ready to, to salute. So, so we did, you know, with the right hand and so on and so forth. And uh, then uh, we stop and um, now he started again because the, the sergeant that was at his right hand before, now he moved to his left. And he asked, um, now that you are to my left, do I salute you with my right arm or with the left? And the, the sergeant uh, said, with the left, of course. 
and this young man did the very best to go and salute them, and and everybody was laughing and. And before long, he used the, the bullhorn to call all the regiment to come and watch this young man uh, do a fantastic salute. Um, during that, that uh, I believe uh, many of us cried because of, he was not aware. He was trying to do his very best. And I think that that was a, a pivotal moment in, in my life in the Army where I, I lost all respect that I had through that experience mm. because it crushed this young man's spirit and we never saw him smile again uh. and he could hardly wait to leave the army after the service. And so you have this, 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 this additional principle that comes up and, and I'm sure that's uh, affected you throughout your life and I know I've had different experiences in my life where, where you kind of love the underdog, the person that is downtrodden uh, and I know you personally, you and I have gotten to know each other and I know you're doing a lot to help those that are, are, are downtrodden in life. So you're continuing on in the army. What else is happening during your stay in the army? Well, I, I think one of the things that I was, uh, because of most of the, the fellows that I got along with, well with, have left and now, it, it was just uh, marking the time, not knowing when I was going to leave. And, and this was so frustrating to me, not knowing when I was going to leave. There was no set time when I said, okay, I will leave at this particular time. Now, Pastor Denosa, there's more to your story because you didn't stay in the army forever, yes. but we are all out of time. And so what I'm gonna encourage our viewer is we're gonna continue this journey with Pastor Denoso. You're not gonna to wanna to miss what happens in his life and how God continues to move. But Pastor Denoso, we're seeing God making movements in your life pivotal things happening to form you for the rest of your life. Let's pray together and pray for that viewer right now who's struggling with some issue in their journey. Would you be willing to pray for sure. us? Father in heaven, perhaps there is someone out there viewing this program today that is going through something similar that I went through. I want to encourage you to put your trust in a loving God and a loving Savior that even though you might not be aware, he is leading. Uh, and I want you to, uh, to ask him to uh, reveal himself to you because it is worth everything that you can hope for uh, because he is an amazing God and he has a wonderful plan for your life. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. everyone. I want to show you a really delicious and easy way to use beans. You've heard me talk before about how good beans are for you. They're chock full of protein, fiber, minerals, phytonutrients, and they're low in fat, cholesterol, and sodium. I think most people probably purchase the canned beans because it's more convenient. Just be sure to wash them well in a colander under running water to rinse off some of that added sodium. Let's look at a really easy way to enjoy chickpeas today. Make sure you've got a pen and paper to write this recipe down. First, this is a chickpea sandwich spread. The ingredients are a can of chickpeas, roughly mashed, a stalk of celery, chopped, a medium carrot, grated, two stalks of green onion, chopped, some mock chicken seasoning to taste, and some soy mayonnaise. So I'm gonna add all this. I've got my chickpeas already just mashed with a fork, or you can put this in a food processor just to speed things up a little bit. I'm adding the green onion and the celery. They're both in here together. Adds a nice little hit of color, plus a great flavor sensation. The carrot really brightens things up beautifully. And what people tell me is, when they taste this, they actually think it's a salmon sandwich, salmon salad sandwich. So, a little bit more of the carrot, and 
some of the soy yogurt, not soy yogurt, soy mayo, putting some of that in to bind it all together beautifully. And I've got some on my finger here, some of this wonderful mock chicken seasoning. And make sure you get a nice vegetarian kind for this. Sprinkle some of that on there. And then all you're gonna do is mix it together. This is so easy. And I'm telling you, it's totally, totally delicious. So just using the soy mayo to bind it all together beautifully. And then you can just put this on some crackers or in a pita bread or, you know, on, on just regular bread for a sandwich. Today, I'm gonna put it into a whole grain pita. And you can put some lettuce in there as well, tomato, whatever you wanna do to make this your sandwich. But I'm telling you, it is totally, totally delicious. Just fill that up. You've got a wonderful, colorful, beautiful, pita right there. There's so many ways you can enjoy chickpeas. Blend them up as hummus or add them to salads and rice. And the same goes for any bean. Make sure to enjoy beans at least several times a week. Consider this. One cup of cooked chickpeas contains 14.5 grams of healthy protein. A two ounce serving of chicken has about 15 grams of protein. So you can see that there's practically no difference with the protein factor. The bonus comes though from the chickpeas because there's no need to worry about saturated fat or cholesterol, both of which you'll find in that chicken. And the high fiber content of beans helps them lower your cholesterol, maintain your blood sugar levels evenly, and fill you up so you don't overeat. When it comes to beans, however you eat them, enjoy them in good health. I'll see you next time. Pastor Donoso, I wanna thank you so much for being with us today on It Is Written. The pleasure has been mine, Chris, to be here. Dear friend, God leads. I want you to join us again next week where we hear the rest of Pastor Donoso's story. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <laughs>